It's been so long. Oh my god, are you keeping? Are you keeping? How's family? <laughs> How's it going? Welcome to another video. Uh, another one? What? What? Yep, we're doing this again. How's it going? Fancy meeting you here, what's the crap? Oh, rabbits! Oh, rabbits. Darn. Welcome! This is so cool. Having you back. Hope you've had a good week and it's been, you've been chilling and your family's been good. And you've had a good VV week. I hope the drops have been well for you. The topic for today is going to be our Frank, Sir Frank Kozik, um, because we have had a little bit of information from him, himself, uh, on Twitter that he will be having a release of a new Labbit this month, September, at some point. So I was kind of planning on, on doing a video on our Frank anyway. So this is pretty cool that it's kind of lined up pretty nicely. I wanted to do a, a deep dive W5 on Frank because I think looking into his history and, and where he came from and all, all the crack with him, I think it will be really cool to know one and have a bit more background history on him. So yeah, that's the plan for today. Should we get started? Little disclaimer, you know the crack. I'm gonna put it here. So you can have a wee look. Okay, so W5, who, what, where, when, why, and today we're going to start with who. So who is our Frank? And how did he come to be the Frank Kozak that we know? So he was born in, in Madrid in 1962 um, to a Spanish mother and a American dad. Uh, he, I believe, established a serviceman. So growing up in Spain, uh, Frank as a young kid really enjoyed Spanish comics. I can't remember the bloody name, but I'll put them here. There was, um, just look them up around that sort of time when he would have been in Spain. Uh, there was a lot of different types of comics and I remember in a clubhouse him saying that, that that's what he sort of got a lot of influence from back then. That was a lot of the material that he would have been consuming that maybe would have inspired him as he got older. Uh, and the type of artistic choices that he, he made could have been influenced from, from that comic book era. So they lived in Madrid up until Frank was around 14, 15, I believe. They moved over to the, the United States. Um, he moved there with his dad and then stayed there for a couple of years. Uh, Frank kind of ended up doing his own thing. He went to the army to do engineering for couple of years and then eventually settled in Austin, Texas where he began to sort of get jobs in like local bars and that's kind of where he, he his world started to open up into the into the punk rock scene uh, the music scene um, and yeah that's kind of where this his journey started to really take off. Moving on to what what kind of art did, did Frank like to make? Um, and what did people kind of think about it? What, what, how did people take the kind of art that he made? Um, so kind of thinking about who he is and, and how he got to where he is. The, the story of him f and how he first got into the bars and, and how I think he was working on security as well, like on the door. Um, and there's a, I've been watching a lot of interviews. So the majority of this information has come from interviews of, of him and his sort of other people on YouTube and in the community and him just telling his story um, and he describes this the first time he was like walking down the street in Austin in the evening and saw this guy with green hair and like big mohawk leather jacket piercings and tattoos and he was just like wow like super drawn to this person um, ran off to him and was like hey dude what's going on you're so cool and, and where can I where can I join in and where what kind of community are you a part of 
and the, and the guy was just like, sure, come on ahead, and like brought him in. And then I think that that's how he got his first job in the bar. That's how he kind of got his exposure to to that scene. Um, and yeah, so so the, the drawing kind of came through that because of him meeting that guy, because of him getting the job in the bars, the performances that were happening in the bars were all these new bands. Um, and I, I'll play a little clip because he kind of explains it a little bit better. I met and did flyers and posters for all these bands on their first tours before they got big and famous. And then when they got big and famous, they're like, hey, dude, will you do a poster for us here? Will you do a poster? You know what I'm saying? So it was this total just organic thing where I was in the right place at the right time. You know, I did the something for Sonic Youth's first tour and all the Butthole Surfer stuff and the Chili Peppers' first tours and Nirvana's first tour and like you name it, you know, any any sort of underground punk or new wave band. I was there after the little show on the first tour, met them because I worked at the club or I did the poster for the club. And like, you know, knew all those people. And so it was kind of like, you know, it's not what you do, it's who you know, right? Cool. So yeah, it kind of began from super humble beginnings, from, from working in these environments to meeting the bands, bands like Nirvana, like he just said, you know, all these people who were just coming up and he was the one to do their very first posters, their very first band artwork, guys. Yeah, guys, they're ready first. And then as the bands got bigger, they continued to love what Frank produced for them. And that's sort of where this journey began for Frank. Crazy. With Frank's silk screening, designing these huge posters, instead of just doing sort of A4 sized, he stepped it up. He got a bit of money, stepped it up, did what nobody else was doing and created these huge silk screen posters when i could produce these great big giant posters then bands and labels from all over the country want stuff because it was a great deal because i could get them a give them a ten thousand dollar print job for free if they would let me sell like a, a run of them right so it just became this diy deal and it, it grew and grew and grew and got really big i got national press the super bright colors and people were like whoa dude how are you even how are you making this how are you making this stuff? And then it just, the, the guts really what got the ball rolling. Um, and he really stuck out in comparison to a lot of people who were making similar things at, at that time. When Frank's work started to gain popularity and to really become this iconic figure in the art and poster design world. So Frank's career has kind of spanned right from the 80s right through to, to today he has really continued and, and made his career very varied um sort of staying with the, the posters for a while then going into the art scene then moving into the toy scene um, and then sort of lots of other design aspects creating clothes and designs for for merchandise for when this is this is really taken off i would say sort of the late 80s right up until today okay so moving on to where frank's art became popular and where did it really find its feet um, obviously a lot of the bands that he would have be, um, been involved with were american based um, and they were all across america moving you know touring so and america's a big place so america was aware of, of frank kosick moving eventually from um, the poster design world into the fine art world. I'm sure places like New York and these really big hubs for, for the creative scene um, would have been a place where he would have been very well known. He took a trip to Japan um, and met up with artists over there who were um, involved with uh, street fashion and the clothing brands um, and that sort of design. I'll let Frank explain. And then because of the posters, I started going to Japan to do poster shows and art shows and crap, right? And like in the late 90s, I was in Japan and I knew all these dudes that were like in the Harajuku area that had like the little clothing labels and shit. So like I met, you know, like Hiroshi Fujiwara, right? And, and Nigo and Electric Neighborhood and 
and fucking uh, Junio and all those, you know, like original wave of Japanese streetwear guys. I believe that Japan was like a pivotal moment for for Frank and his his career. It just opened all of these new um, opportunities for him. Phoebe is a new way for Frank to express himself in a, in a 3D digital way, which is another string to his bow, so to speak. Um, and that again is happening, you know, it's it's spread out all over the world. Um, and Frank's work through Vivi has been distributed all over the world um, in a way that he, had, you know, he has described as, as just insane in comparison to maybe his physical pieces. Obviously, they, they, you know, they're they're well known and appreciated. But with Vivi, wherever we are in the world, we're all able to experience his his work, which is just mint. It's mint. And moving lastly on to the question of why, why does Frank make this kind of art? Why do we love it? And what draws us to it? And what what makes it appealing? Uh, to the eye and then I'll just sort of talk about why, why I think it's sick as well. Frank's art really questions um, questions media, makes us question what we're looking at. Mixing in like big IPs that we all, we all recognize like Simpsons, Marvel um, and, and taking these characters and giving them like a new persona almost through his, his design. Um, whether that's 2D or 3D. The, the contradictory nature of Frank's work. Um, is important, challenging, you know, it kind of refer, refers, refers back to the, the last video where, you know, art doesn't always have to be beautiful and, and pretty and, you know, the reaction can be, whoa, or, you know, you're a bit confused or it doesn't always have to look like sweetness and light. And I think, um, yeah, I think that reflects Frank Kozik in a, in a lot of ways. So just to summarise Frank's awesomeness, I'll just put a wee summary up here so you can have a wee look. I'm going to start doing this at the end of every video. We've all come to know Frank through Vivi. Well, I certainly didn't know of Frank specifically before Vivi. I've probably seen his artwork on album covers and things like that, but thinking about the artist behind the artwork uh, and the album cover is a super cool thing and I've learned so much. There's so many other artists out there who have come from these kind of humble beginnings and then ended up where they are today with just grind and, you know, really stick into what they know and what they love and not like changing it up for anyone, which is another super commendable thing. And I just have to thank Vivi specifically for, for exposing me and my, my partner and my family and all of us to the amazing world of design and art and 3 ness and VR and everything. This is just a whole new world and for us and for Frank and artists in general. It's a whole new medium and it's super freaking exciting. Can't wait to see what, what he comes up with in the next couple of weeks. It's gonna be sick. That's your lot. It's my lot on this subject of our Frank. But yeah, stay weird, stay wonderful. Thank you so much for watching. Love ya.